Hi everyone and welcome to our USIPCO presentation on near field focusing using phased arrays with dynamic polarization control. I am Nitin Jonathan Myers, an assistant professor at the Delft Center for Systems and Control here at TU Delft and today I will be presenting this joint work with Yanki Aslan and Geetu Joseph from the microelectronics department over here. So let me start off by giving you a quick perspective over here. I started looking at near field communication a couple of years ago and I bumped into several new exciting research directions in this niche area. Today I'll be talking about one such problem on near field beam forming or focusing with special phased arrays called as dynamic polarization control DPC phased arrays. These arrays have been recently proposed in the circuits community and today we are going to look at them from a signal processing perspective, specifically focusing on the beam forming problem. Here is a quick summary of my presentation today. I'll first start off with near field communication, highlighting aspects such as polarization and beam forming, and then I'll get into the beam former optimization problem and then the simulation results. So let's get started with some background on near field communication first. Traditionally, wireless systems have been extensively studied and designed in the so-called far-field propagation regime. This regime comprises all the coordinates that are away from the radiating antenna by at least the frown of a distance, which is 2d square over lambda. Here d denotes the length of the antenna array and lambda denotes the wavelength. Now, as we head towards higher carrier frequencies such as millimeter wave and terahertz systems, where the wavelengths get smaller, the front of a distance increases for a given aperture. And we quickly get into the so-called radiative near field region. Unlike the far field regime where the wave fronts are planar, the wave fronts in the near field region are spherical. Due to this spherical nature, we basically need to rethink MIMO system design all the way from hardware implementation to algorithms and waveforms. In my opinion, these near field problems are extremely important today given the interest in 6G applications shown over here. All the way from chip to chip communication to vehicular communication with large intelligent surfaces, communication is going to be near field in these settings shown over here. And today's talk is going to be extremely relevant in all of these settings. Okay. So the focus of today's presentation, as I mentioned, is on beam forming for near field communication. When we talk about beam forming in 5G or 802.11 what comes to mind is the picture over here, where the transmitter focuses signal or beam form signal along direction that best suits a user. Such directional beam forming, however, is optimal only in the far field and not in the near field. In the near field regime, the transmitter can basically focus power in a small region around the receiver. The width of this region is determined by the length of the antenna array. Okay? If we have a very large antenna array, then RF signals can be focused in an extremely small region around the receiver. There's been some interesting recent work on near field communication, which has looked at some problems related to channel capacity, channel estimation, and wideband beam forming. All of these papers, however, do not account for polarization effects in the channel, which is extremely important in the near field. Today, I'm going to talk about the beam forming aspect in near field communication. And I'll first show you that the optimal polarization configuration very spatially across the array in near field systems. This is very different from our understanding for far field systems where the optimal polarization called configuration is flat across the array. Next, I'll motivate the use of DPC phased arrays to beam form even under such spatially varying polarization characteristics. So let's get started by moving on to the system and channel model considered in our paper. So here is a system with a DPC phased array at the transmitter and a single dipole antenna at the receiver. One way to implement dynamic polarization control 
at the transmitter is to have two dipole antennas that are mounted at 90 degrees to each other. And then these two dipole antennas can be independently fed with RF signals that are amplitude control and phase shifted. Let me give you an example here. Let's say absolute value of fx of k is 0. Then this DPC dipole antenna over here sends out zero signal and the other dipole antenna oriented along y hat sends out an RF signal. Okay. In this case, the resultant signal going out of this DPC antenna is linearly polarized with the polarization oriented along y hat. And in another case where absolute value of fx and absolute value of fy are equal and let's say the phase shifts differ by 90 degrees, the resultant wave coming out of the DPC antenna is circularly polarized. Okay. Now, as we notice here, the polarization of the electric field coming out from every antenna can be independently controlled by tweaking these amplitude controllers and the phase shift controllers at each and every dipole. Okay. When we model all the weights in the vectors fx and fy, associated with the two polarizations, the received signal is shown over here. It's basically hx transpose fx plus hy transpose fy times a scaled version of the transmitted symbol plus noise. Okay. Here hx is the channel vector which contains the channel coefficients between all the x-oriented dipoles and the receiver and hy represents the channel between the y-oriented dipoles and the receiver. Let's now understand what goes into the channel vector hx and similarly also hy. So for that let's consider a basic system with just two isotropic antennas. For such a system we know that the unpolarized channel component is given by this equation where the constant term sitting over here okay, comes from the freeze propagation equation and the phase term over here comes due to the delay in the wave. Okay. Next, when we have two dipoles instead of these isotropic antennas, there is an antenna gain associated with the transmitter that's shown over here and similarly there's a different antenna gain at the receiver. Okay. Finally, the receiver sees a strong channel when the dipole vector v hat okay, is aligned with the direction of the electric field generated by the transmitter. And this direction of the electric field impinging at the receiver is given by E k hat. Okay, So E k hat is a unit vector along the direction of the electric field coming out from the transmitter. Okay. Now by putting together all these things, the polarized channel model is given by the product of all of these components that we looked at above. Okay. Now by setting U k hat equals x hat, Okay, we get the channel coefficients in the vector hx and by setting uk hat equals y hat, okay, we get the channel coefficients in the vector hy. Recall that hx represents the channel between all the x oriented dipoles and the receive antenna and hy represents the channel between all the y oriented dipoles and the receive antenna. Okay? Now there are two important things to note here. First is that the usual van der Mond approximations that we use for far field systems cannot be applied to HX and HY. Okay? This is because the far field approximation fails in the near field region. Okay? Also the antenna gains and the polarization components given by GX case and beta case vary with the antenna index k. Okay? This is different from our understanding in the far field case where the antenna gains and the polarization mismatch factors remain constant across the array. Okay? Now that we have defined the system and channel models, our goal next is to design a beamformer or equivalently the antenna weights fx and fy to maximize the signal to noise ratio at the receiver. The constraint that we have here is that the power going out of every antenna is constant. Okay, so let's now see how this optimization problem is solved to determine the beam formal. We start off by maximizing the signal to noise ratio or equivalently maximizing 
the square root of the SNR. Okay. Now this maximization is achieved when the phase profiles are exactly same as that of the conjugate beamformer. So recall that in a conjugate beamformer, the phase profiles are simply the negative of the phase of the channel. Okay. Then our next goal is to determine the magnitudes to be applied at the amplitude controllers. The optimized magnitudes are shown over here. These magnitudes have a structure that is very similar to the maximum ratio transmission, in short MRT beamformer, except for the different scalings that come in due to the per antenna power constraint at the DPC antennas. Okay. Now let's check out the polarization configuration associated with the optimized transmit beamformer. With the optimized beamformer, the electric field generated at the X and the Y dipoles are shown over here. For the optimum solution here, it can be shown that the phase shift between these two fields is either 0 degrees or 180 degrees. This means that the resultant electric field at every antenna is linearly polarized with a polarization angle that's shown over here. I just sketched out a quiver plot of the polarization angle associated with the optimized beamformer over here. We notice that the optimal polarization angle varies across the antenna array. Okay. And this happens only in the near field regime where the distance is smaller than the front of a distance, okay, which is 2d square over lambda. At larger distances of say about 1 meter where we are in the far field regime, the optimal polarization angle is almost constant across the entire array. Okay. Now this spatial variation in the optimum polarization configuration at shorter distances clearly motivates the need for DPC phased arrays in near field communication. Okay. Standard phased arrays don't work well here because we cannot change the polarization angle across different antenna elements with such arrays. I'll now discuss some more simulation results before concluding this presentation. Okay. In our simulations, we consider two standard architectures other than the DPC phase array. The first one is the dual polarization phase array where each of the H and V polarized antennas are linked to a phase array and then digital beamforming is performed across these two streams. The second one is a switch polarization phase array where beamforming is performed by selecting just one of the two phase arrays associated with the two polarizations. Clearly, we see that the DPC phase array is slightly more sophisticated than these two architectures. This is because the polarization of the signal can be controlled independently at each and every DPC antenna. So these DPC antennas are shown by these little boxes in orange over here. In our paper, we created multiple line of sight channel realizations for every combination of this D and alpha. This is done by rotating the receiver about its own axis along the azimuth as well as the elevation dimensions. So in our simulations, we consider 300 gigahertz carrier and 100 megahertz bandwidth corresponding to a narrowband system. The transmit array has a radius of 15 centimeter and the power transmitted through this entire array is 1 milliwatt. From the box plot on the left, we notice that the DPC phased array achieves a higher SNR than the switch polarization architecture. This is natural because the switch polarization architecture can operate at just one of the two polarization angles, okay, either H or V. The DPC array on the other hand can change the polarization angle. Okay. From the box plot on the right, we see that DPC phased arrays perform better than dual polarization architecture at short distances. At longer distances, however, the improvement is negligible. This is because the optimal polarization angle is spatially invariant at large distances and as a result, a dual polarization architecture suffices in this regime. Finally, we looked at the achievable rate and noticed that the DPC phased array achieves slightly higher rate than the benchmark architectures. Okay. That said, let me just give you a quick summary of what we've seen in this talk. 
We saw that the optimum polarization configuration varies spatially across the array in the near field, which motivated the use of a DPC phased array. We also saw that DPC phased arrays are useful over standard phased arrays at short distances. In future, we would like to work on some interesting signal processing problems for DPC phased arrays. These include dual polarization channel estimation, waveform design, and beam codebook design. Thank you for listening and see you at UCIPCO.